All right, I think we can get started. Uh, welcome everyone to our May Art Bites. Happy Cinco de Mayo. Um, for those of you that I haven't met before, I'm Kate Kunow, I'm the Associate Curator at the Cedar Rapids Museum of Art. Um, and today we're taking a little break from the Grantwood focus that we've had lately. And we're gonna look at um, a bunch of works by Mexican and Mexican-American artists, um, both in our collection and in private collections. Uh, we thought that would be a nice way to celebrate the day. Um, I am a little bit lower energy than usual. I'm a day out from my second Pfizer vaccine. So I'm not, not at peak performance, but I'm very excited. And so welcome to the, the right-hand side of my living room. I am doing this from home. But let's get started. There we go. Uh, so I wanted to share a little bit um, where the inspiration for this came from. It's from our lovely preparator at the CRMA, Judy Frauenholz. Um, and she shared with me a beautiful set of prints from the artist Jean Flores that she has in her private collection. Um, and we were just talking about ideas for the May Art Bites and things we could do. And she mentioned this print series. Um, that is inspired by Mexican aphorisms and folklore. And so we thought that'd be a great way to jump off with this. Uh, Jean Flores, who I believe is on the call. I think I saw Jean's name pop up on the Zoom call. So he is in attendance. Um, so certainly correct me if I'm wrong about any of this, Jean. Um, but Jean Flores was born and raised in El Paso, Texas, earned his BFA from the University of Texas, El Paso, uh, went on to earn an MA and MFA in printmaking with honors from the University of Iowa in Iowa City, and worked at the CRMA as a gallery preparator. So it's a real tour de force of CRMA preparators today. Uh, in 2001, he moved to Portland, Oregon to teach painting, drawing, and printmaking at Portland Community College and Clackamas Community College. Um, he's been a full-time faculty member at the Portland Community College since 2005, where he is Dean of the Visual and Performing Arts and Design um, at their Sylvania campus. So thank you so much to Judy for suggesting this as a theme, and thank you for Jean for providing the beautiful imagery that we're going to start with today. Uh, so Judy and I were looking through these, um, and they're really wonderful. As you can see, we're looking at, we're going to do three sets of three just to start. Um, and so these all have really wonderful sayings at the bottom, along with um, Jean's really beautiful imagery, which to me is very reminiscent of Goya or Maurizio Lazansky, if you're a little closer to Cedar Rapids and familiar with his work, but the, the line and the tone are just wonderful. And so working from left to right here, we have without father or mother or dog to bark at him. And yes, um, the bull one here in the middle is my personal favorite. And sorry, I'm getting these a little out of order. Oh, yes. The one in the middle is he, do does, he who does not look to the future stays in the past. Uh, and the one on the right, <laughs> another favorite of mine, uh, small town, big hell, which I can appreciate as somebody who grew up in a very small town. Moving on to these. Um, the first one on the left is everyone is the master of their fears. Uh, in the middle, we have another favorite. It never rains to everyone's satisfaction, uh, which is a very, very true, true moment there. And the one on the right is the more one bends over, the more his ass is shown, which Judy and I very much enjoyed when we got the translation for that. Uh, and our next set an ounce of freedom is worth more than 500 pounds of gold. Uh, in the middle, and I'll draw your attention to the middle one because I love these kind of chicken men that are standing in front of the laundry lines. The imagery is just wonderful there. Uh, and this one is, who knows two languages is worth two people. And our last one. Oops. <laughs> Oh, I apologize. Um, I did one incorrectly. This one is the more one bends over, the more his ass is shown. I think the one, the one that I attributed that to earlier was not that. Um, but I wanted to thank both Jean and Judy for these because they really got us thinking about um, Cinco de Mayo and just mixing it up a little. As I'm sure all of you know, we've been very heavy in our Grant Wood imagery lately in our Grant Wood discussions, which is wonderful. And we're super excited to celebrate him. Um, but it's nice to take a little break from that as well. 
Uh, so just before we start, Cinco de Mayo is the annual celebration that commemorates the Mexican army's victory over the French empire at the Battle of Puebla in 1862 um, under the leadership of General Zaragoza. So this victory of the smaller Mexican force against the larger French force was a boost to morale for Mexicans. Uh, Zaragoza died a couple of months after the battle due to illness. And a year after the battle, a larger French force defeated the Mexican army at the Second Battle of Puebla and Mexico City soon fell to invaders. Um, this is more popularly celebrated in the United States than it actually is in Mexico. Um, the date has become associated with the celebration of Mexican American culture. These celebrations actually began in California where they have been observed annually since 1863. And the day gained popularity nationwide in the 1980s, especially due to advertising campaigns by beer and wine companies. Um, if you've ever been in any city on Cinco de Mayo, you know it has a rich drinking culture associated with it. Uh, today, Cinco de Mayo generates beer sales on par with the Super Bowl. Uh, in Mexico, the commemoration of the battle continues to be mostly ceremonial through military parades or battle reenactments. And Cinco de Mayo was also sometimes mistaken for Mexico's Independence Day, uh, the most national, the most important national holiday in Mexico, and that celebrated on September 16th. Um, and that commemorates the cry of Dolores, which in 1810 initiated the Mexican War of Independence from Spain. Um, so I just, <laughs> I know I kind of grew up not really knowing what Cinco de Mayo was. So I wanted to start with that so we know exactly what we are celebrating. Uh, and so moving into works that are actually in the CRMA's collection, we have three really strong ones that I wanted to talk about today. Uh, the first of which is Enrique Chagoya's Double Trouble or the Anthology of the Clone from 2005. Um, and this has actually been on view several times in the past five years. I think I've used it twice since I became curator. Uh, and it's a really beautiful lithograph and collage um, Shigoya is known for doing these very long codices, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but <laughs> pardon me. Enrique Shigoya, who we're looking at here, received his BFA from the San Francisco Art Institute in 1984 and his Master of Arts and Master of Fine Arts from the University of California, Berkeley in 87. Uh, he currently teaches at Stanford University as an associate professor of art. He was born and raised in Mexico City and draws upon his past experiences and cultural knowledge to combine them with modern day images and icons. Uh, when he moved to San Francisco, he became exposed to many of the social and political issues being addressed at that time regarding feminism and race. For something a little bit closer to home, the Des Moines Art Center did a major retrospective of his work in 2007. Um, so if you were lucky enough to see that, it must've been really wonderful. Uh, so he developed his artwork as a commentary regarding culture and its ever-changing nature. Um, the various images that we'll see here create a visual dialogue that combine past and present uh, through a lot of historical and cultural symbols. Uh, so as I said, his work that we have in the collection takes the form of a folding codex book. And this is a really common format in Shigoya's work. These codices um, act as visual, historical, and cultural narratives. And he utilizes this format because it was once used by the Mayans and other ancient cultures. Um, so these codices, very few still exist in like Mayan codices, very few still exist in the world. Franciscan missionaries burned nearly all of the Maya's written records in an effort to eradicate their religion. Today, there are only three or four of these ancient Mayan codices that remain, and they're named for the European cities in which they're held. So there's the Dresden Codex, the Paris Codex, and the Madrid Codex. Um, Enrique Chagoya studied many of these works, um, but when he went to the Bibliothèque Imperiale in Paris to study the Paris Codex, they thought he was a security risk because he was from Mexico and they were scared that he was going to steal the codex and repatriate it to his country. Um, so a lot of his imagery deals with colonialism and teasing out the threads of, well, what would have happened if Europeans hadn't come to the North American continent and how that would have looked. Uh, so you can see here, there's a lot of blending of pop culture and political narrative um, in this really beautiful, saturated uh, artistic style. So this is wonderful. This is a close up of the piece that we have at the museum and some more here. So there's so much imagery and it's so thick. And um, if you look at the piece in the center that's here, they are little googly eyes. And so if you, you move the codex a little, the eyes do bobble a little bit. 
Um, so this is a really fun one to have out just because there's so much to look at. Um, and of course, you know, we have who's your daddy in a very Hebrew looking script with um, the Muslim figure and then John Wayne in the center. I love Lucy next to a mammy figure. There's a lot going on in all of these. And so they're very layered and they're really interesting to tease apart. And of course the whole thing is designed as this Mayan codex. So the very form of the artwork goes back to this you know, ancient way that the Mayans recorded their history that was subsequently destroyed by their colonial oppressors. Um, so Shigoya's work is really fascinating and I feel very lucky that we have this piece in our collection. Um, because it is paper, I can't have it out as much as I would like to, but I certainly have had it out uh, twice in the, in the six years that I've been here. Uh, so the second work that I wanted to talk about is Luis Jimenez's War Horse from 2001. Um, this is a lithograph that the museum purchased in 2006. And so Luis Jimenez, whom we're seeing here on the left, he is known primarily for his large scale public sculptures. His subject matter reflects his Hispanic roots and his experience growing up in the Southwest. Jimenez was really influenced by the murals of Jose Orozco and Diego Rivera, uh, but he also has roots in pop art and more contemporary work. Um, as he saw in the modernism of Mexican muralists and also in the regionalism of Thomas Hart Benton and of course our own Grant Wood. So heroic horse sculptures like the one we see behind him are Jimenez's, were Menhez's forte, but his art was intended for the people. He was very proud of his Chicano heritage and his working class background. Um, and he really championed the common man in his work. Uh, so he grew up working in his father's shop, making neon signs. Um, he was really interested in low rider car culture. And so he often features brightly painted fiberglass bodywork in his um, pieces. <coughs> Pardon me. What makes his sculptures come alive and also what makes it sculptural um, he gives life to Olmec heads, Aztec serpents. He's inspired by the sculptures of Rodin. And as we can see here on the right, he's also a prolific printmaker. Um, he frequently uses prints both as studies for his sculpture projects and as original image statements. He graduated from UT Austin in 1964 with degrees in art and architecture. Um, he is exhibited profusely throughout the United States and internationally. Uh, unfortunately, he died at the age of 65 in 2006 in his studio in Hondo, New Mexico. He was actually working on a 32 foot high um, sculpture, Blue Mustang, that was intended for the Denver International Airport. Um, and it unfortunately fell on him. Uh, so he definitely died too young. But Warhorse, the print that we have in our collection, um, is a really good example of his print work. And so we see this fiery war stallion with a nuclear mushroom cloud in the background. Um, so this specifically speaks to his roots in New Mexico and the prolific number of U.S. government military industrial projects and institutions and toxic waste dumps in New Mexico. Uh, so there's a lot of imagery here that's really rooted in the state where he had settled. And it's a really stunning piece. Um, again, this was up relatively recently. This was up in our 125 exhibition. Um, that just ended a couple of months ago. So there was a chance to see this very recently. So I hope you all got to see it in person because it is really lovely. And the third piece that I wanted to look at today um, from our Mexican and Mexican-American artists in the collection. This is David Alfaro Siqueiros, uh, Femme qui marche. And I apologize, neither my Spanish nor my French are very good. If these were Italian, I could really work on the accent, but this is Advancing Woman, to use it in English, from 1967. Uh, and so Siqueiros uh, was born in 1896 in Chihuahua, and he is best known as a Mexican social realist painter. So we've gone back a little bit. Um, <coughs> pardon. He's a couple of generations before Chagoya um, and Jimenez. Um, he is best known as being one of the three Mexican muralists, along with Diego Rivera and Jose Clemente Orozco, um, really, really famous in the early 20th century. He was also a member of the Mexican Communist Party, a Stalinist, and a supporter of the Soviet Union, uh, who actually led an unsuccessful attempt to assassinate Leon Trotsky in, in 1940. Obviously, a more successful attempt was later made. Uh, so by accordance to Spanish naming customs, his surname would normally have been Alfaro, but like Picasso, 
Um, and Lorca, Siqueiros used his mother's surname. So Siqueiros is his mother's name the same way Picasso is actually Picasso's mother's last name as opposed to his father's. Uh, Siqueiros changed his given name from Jose to David after his first wife called him by it in an allusion to Michelangelo's David sculpture, which I love. Uh, so Siqueiros was really politically active ever since his youth. He studied at the San Carlos Academy of Fine Arts in Mexico City uh, before leaving in 1913 to fight in the army of Nustiano Carranza during the Mexican Revolution. And he later continued his art studies in Europe. In 1922, after returning to Mexico, Siqueiros helped paint the frescoes on the walls of the National Preparatory School and also began organizing and leading unions of artists and working men. Uh, during the Spanish Civil War, he commanded several brigades for the Republicans, and over four decades, his labor union work and communist political activities led to numerous jailings and periods of exile. He visited the United States, the Soviet Union, and many Latin American countries as a lecturer and guest. Um, so as I said, he's best known as a muralist, so the work that we have in the collection is on the right-hand side, our Advancing Woman from 1967, um, and this is just a really wonderful self-portrait of him that I loved that's on the left. Uh, so most of his large murals are in government buildings in Mexico. They're distinguished by a great dynamism and compositional movement. Um, many of them, as murals go, tend to be very monumental. There's a real sculptural treatment of forms, which I think you can definitely see in his self-portrait here on the left. Um, but I don't think his print work is any less interesting. I love the forms and the composition and certainly the colors in Advancing Woman. And I think it's a really... Um, stunning takeaway. It's different from his mural work. This is obviously much more abstracted than the other works that we've seen, um, but I think it has such a volume and an energy to it. So it's a cool way to see a different side of his work. Um, you know, something that we don't associate so much with Siqueiros or Orozco or Rivera. So those are the Mexican and Mexican American artists whose prints that we have in our collection. Um, but I also wanted to end by circling back to um, some artists that we have in our, one artist particularly that we have in our collection who is inspired by these Mexican and Mexican American artists and Mexican culture gener more generally. And this of course is Chuck Barth, um, who is of course a Cedar Rapidian and retired Mount Mercy University professor. Um, dividing his time between Cedar Rapids and Oaxaca, Mexico. And so Barth creates paintings, prints, and installations based on what he sees and experiences from Mexican culture. Um, so these are two new acquisitions that we've just gotten in the last year. Time is a flat circle, but I'm, I'm going to go ahead and say it was sometime in 2020. Uh, and these are two portraits of Maximilian and Carlotta, who were the... <laughs> the brief and only Habsburg emperor and empress of Mexico from 1864 to 1867, if I'm remembering my history. <coughs> um, and so Chuck Barth is really inspired by what he sees in Mexican visual culture and what he experiences there. And we have a number of his works in the collection. Um, this is another one that was recently on view. This is his Festival of the Fish. Um, and so it's also interesting to see um, artists that don't have Mexican heritage interpreting that rich, rich visual culture uh, and celebrating it themselves. So we're really lucky to have excellent examples of all kinds of this stuff in the collection. Um, so this was a really fun opportunity to take a look at those things that we have um, and kind of celebrate our collection in a way that we don't always get a chance to. I will wish everyone a lovely Cinco de Mayo, and I hope you can get out there um, and enjoy the wonderful day that we're having.